cardamom for breakfast. Oh, and that is why you don't eat spices straight, folks. Hello, and welcome to The Spice Show. Today's guest of honor, cardamom. Cardamom is a very entrancing spice. It has a minty, eucalyptusy, winter fresh flavor that is tamed by a woodsy earthiness. There's a sweetness present, but the perfume, breathtaking. There's something about the flavor of cardamom that just makes you feel like your head is in the skies, but your feet are still planted firmly on the ground. And that's just when it comes to green cardamom, because believe it or not, there's also black cardamom. And if you were to compare the two, they are almost like different spices. While green cardamom has the perfume of a sweet pine mint, black cardamom is smoky all the way through. It has this very resiny smell that reminds me of church incense. Overwhelming, extremely invasive in your nostril, and overpowering. And I hate to say it, but if you sniff too deep, it almost smells a little bit like pee. Before I go any further, let's chat with Ethan from Burlap and Barrel to see what he has to say about cardamom. Hi, Ethan. Hey, Jen, how are you? I'm okay. We're here to talk about cardamom today. My favorite. Is it really? Well, it's one of them, yeah, for sure. It's because of the, the kind of light gingery fragrant notes, it works really well in sweet dishes. And then those like herbal, lemony, citrusy, minty flavors work really well in savory dishes. I feel like you're talking about green cardamom right now. I am talking about green cardamom, which which is the default, but I appreciate you sort of calling that out. And there are uh, probably five or six different varieties and they're all kind of designated by different color names. It's used a lot in Middle Eastern cooking, often with drinks or with sweets. And it's used quite a bit in Scandinavian baking randomly. And then the other varieties of cardamom are used in a lot of different uh, cuisines around the world. But Guatemala is the largest exporter. So basically all the cardamom that we have access to here in the U.S. is grown in Guatemala. Is there a specific climate that the plant requires? Cool temperatures, a little bit of altitude, not too much sunlight, quite a bit of humidity. I mean, I have a cardamom plant in my living room and there are records of people using cardamom, especially for medicinal benefits, uh, going back basically as long as we have written records of anything. There's wow. a Sumerian medical tablet uh, that talks about using cardamom to treat digestive and respiratory issues, which is still actually how it's used in Ayurveda and, and traditional Chinese medicine and lots of other uh, traditional medicine practices. Okay, so what is um, your favorite way to use cardamom? There are essentially two ways to cook with it from a technique perspective. You know, you've got that pod, the outer husk and the inner seeds. The outer husk of the cardamom has about 10% of the essential oils and the seeds have about 90%. So the seeds are much more potent, uh, but there still is flavor in the pod. Um, if you're cooking something in liquid, boiling rice or beans or tea or anything that's going to cook in liquid for a period of time, I would say like just bust up the whole pods a little bit so that they open and the seeds, the inner seeds are sort of exposed to the liquid and let them simmer for basically as long as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, if you're cooking in something where you want the flavor to be a little more forward, uh, you know, often you can mix ground cardamom and that's usually the pods and the seeds ground up together. You can mix ground pot cardamom in at the end of the cooking process. And then the third way is to cook with just the seeds themselves, uh, which you can either grind or use whole. Um, cardamom seeds in a chocolate chip cookie are great because you get these little like pops of cardamom flavor, but you can also put them in a pepper grinder and grind them into whatever you're cooking. Like you might use black pepper or, or any other whole spice. That is both for green and black cardamom? Would you use it separately like that too? So that's typically for green or for yellow cardamom, which is another sort of distinction. Cardamom is graded, like a lot of spices, is graded by color and by size, which don't really matter for flavor, but that's how the grading system works. So dark green cardamom is considered to be more valuable, mm -hmm. uh, but in order for cardamom to be, to, to be dark green when it's dried, it has to be picked a little bit under ripe. So I I think actually better cardamom is what's sometimes called yellow cardamom. Same uh, plant, just a little bit longer ripening period on the vine. And if you can't get your hands or car on cardamom, would there be other spices that you would recommend as substitutions for that flavor? 
Yeah, there are, um, so cardamom is in the ginger and turmeric family. Um, the plants actually look very similar. The, you know, in ginger turmeric, obviously we're eating the rhizome, the root of the plant, cardamom we're eating the fruit, but the plants themselves, the stalks and the leaves look quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can't get cardamom, ginger is a, an imperfect substitute, but a related plant with, with some similar flavors. Um, there are also other plants that are related to cardamom uh, and used in other cuisines, grains of paradise, used in a lot of uh, Ethiopian cooking is a cardamom relative, um, alligator pepper, or used in a lot of West African cooking, also a cardamom relative. So there are, there are some related plants that show up in other cuisines. Is there one cardamom recipe that you will love for the rest of your life? Uh, honestly, I just uh, put the cardamom seeds in a grinder and I put them into all kinds of random stuff. I'm not, I'm not picky. Even a little cardamom ground into coffee or tea just, uh, just tastes great. So I feel like as we're learning on the spice show, really any spice can be used in almost any situation. It just depends on personal preference and your desire to experiment with it really. Yeah, for sure. There are obviously a million traditional applications and any website or, or cookbook about South Asian cooking will use tons of cardamom. Um, so there are ways to use it traditionally, but if you're just getting started, it's not something you've really cooked with before. I always suggest just adding a little bit to a dish that you already know so you can really see how the flavors change. Cool, thank you so much, Ethan, for sharing all of this knowledge and I look forward to cooking with it all day today. Yeah, thanks for having me. To really get a gauge of what the flavors are, seed versus the covering of the pod, we're going to grind down the seeds and the coverings of the pod separately and taste them. Even before I grind it down, I can already smell that the covering of this black cardamom pod is way smokier than the actual seeds. The seeds themselves have definitely a more minty eucalyptusy flavor that I associate with the green cardamom. As with the green cardamom, the shells themselves actually smell a quite bit mintier than the seeds. The seeds are a little more delicate, floral, maybe even a little bit sweeter in that nutty way. This is the hull of the pod. This is the seed. cardamom for breakfast. Ooh. And that is why you don't eat spices straight, folks. Ooh, my mouth feels so fresh, so chill, cool, like a winter breeze. Green cardamom seeds, very bitter straight off the bat, but then you get rushed in with a cooling mintiness. That flavor, that aroma just carries you away. It's a perfume that is slightly balanced between the air and the sky and the earth. Almost makes me feel like I'm a little bird flying through a meadowed forest. It's a nice day. The hull of the pod is a little more fibrous and a little less intense in flavor. Has a nice aroma still, but just not quite as punchy. As for the black cardamom, oh yeah, smells potent. Mm. Mm. Oh, oh my god, that just brought back really unpleasant memories of Chinese medicine in my youth. Surprisingly not as cleanly bitter as the green cardamom seed, it has a little bit of an anise, licorice -y vibe to it. It's a little mustier, and the bitterness actually hits at the end of the flavors, rather than the beginning. It kind of looks a little bit more like black pepper and white pepper ground together, and I have to say, it's not that far from the taste of both of those combined, too. That is not a good pucker. Freddy, you wanna smell black cardamom? The hull of the black cardamom is almost tart at the onset, almost as if it had a little bit of an off vinegary taste to it. Pickle, maybe? I see lots of potential for us to play with here. Of course, the key thing to remember here is that these are spices, not food. So as long as you use the proper amount, the flavors are undeniably gonna color your dishes. Just because you don't like the taste of it straight on your tongue doesn't mean you're not gonna love it hidden and layered inside other flavors. Let's start it off easy. This morning, let's have some cardamom tea. 
Now cardamom is featured prominently in masala chai, which is a tea that is spiced with lots of different things like cinnamon, cloves, black pepper, ginger. Usually it's black tea cooked down with a little bit of sugar with milk and it's stretched, tossed in the air until it's nice and frothy and creamy and you have the most decadent cup of milky tea ever. We have a recipe for masala chai and if you're interested, we'll leave it in the description box below. But today, we're just gonna go with our pot, a little bit of water, and a little bit of crushed cardamom pods. Like Ethan said, you wanna give these pods a little bit of a crush slam bang to really release that seam open. That way, the potency of those seeds will be mixed in with your water as it boils, and then you'll have the most fragrant, simple tea to start your day off with. I don't really measure this, just go with about a tablespoon to about, I don't know, three cups of water. As with all tea, however strong you like it is however strong you should make it. Once your cardamom seeds have split open, have bloated a little bit, and you can smell that sweet mintiness floating off of your pot, go ahead and turn it off, and you should have this light, light, golden honey colored liquid. And while there's no sugar in here, you can feel free to drop in a little bit of honey, but as is, it smells fantastic. I like to make it super strong and then you can ice it down for a cold version as well. Super refreshing in the summer. Maybe it's time to switch up your iced tea of the year. And for you folks who live a drug-free lifestyle, best part is no caffeine. This tea also comes with built-in breath mints, the cardamom seeds, now tender enough to chew. Perfect for a date. You're welcome. And if you're hoping for a little more spunk in your drink, how about some mold wine with cardamom then? In a large pot, pour in your bottle of red wine along with some sliced orange, cloves, cinnamon sticks, star anise, and then your cardamom. Make sure you are crushing them to release that aromatic flavor. Go in with a little bit of smashed ginger, as well as a tiny pinch of nutmeg, a little bit of honey, a little bit of brandy, and set that fire on. Simmer it over medium, medium low heat for about 10 minutes or so to let all the flavors mingle together. Give it a stir every once in a while to make sure everything's getting swimmingly along. You have spicy from the ginger, minty from the cardamom, tart and sweet from the honey and the orange, and all in all, even if you don't like wine out of the bottle, I think you will like this one. And now that we're nice and toasty, what do you say that we cook something? Because there's only so much wine I can drink before I go bonkers. Which is not a bad thing, I just want some food, you know? And no, boozy oranges don't count, but they are delicious. First stop on our cooking adventure, bread. Like Ethan had mentioned, in Finland and Sweden, cardamom bread is very popular. Now oftentimes, it's got like a brioche thing going on in rich dough with butter and milk and sugar and all of that good stuff, but today I'm feeling a little bit lazy. I'm thinking instead we'll just make a no-knead bread, I'll throw in some bread flour, rye flour, I'll give some of this evaporated milk a place to go. So all you'll need to start is a large bowl. And into this large bowl, we're gonna go in with some lukewarm water along with our evaporated milk. We're gonna add some yeast in along with some sugar and stir it until it's dissolved. So right away into my yeast mixture, I'm gonna add in my bread flour, my rye flour, a little bit of salt along with some ground cardamom and our cardamom seeds for that pop that Ethan was talking about. And for added nuttiness, I'm gonna throw in some toasted sunflower seeds, totally up to you. You can substitute flax seeds, you can substitute sesame seeds, crushed nuts, do you. To get a nice blend of what cardamom has to offer, I'm gonna use a little bit of the green and a little bit of the black. And once everything is in that bowl, go ahead and give it a nice good stir until everything comes together. And you wanna work that dough just until you don't see any dry spots and all that water and milk is evenly distributed. I'm not recommending that you eat raw dough, but this is the best way to check up on the flavoring of your bread, especially if you're not using a recipe per se. And this one tastes pretty good. Cover that bowl up with a towel and just let it be until it doubles in size. And then we're going to basically do a sourdough thing where you lift and fold it over to develop that gluten formation. I'm gonna do this about four to five times over the next three to four hours, just until I feel like that dough has gathered enough shape to hold that formation in the oven. 
And while we're waiting for our bread to rise, what do you say to some potato curry? I hope you said yes, because my potatoes are starting to grow eyeballs and they really gotta go. But before we can make potato curry, we gotta make curry powder of which cardamom is featured prominently in the flavors. Now obviously there's a lot of different kinds of curries in the world, and curry really just is a lot of spices mashed together, tasting delicious in unison. And cacophony sometimes, you know? And even though curry powder originated in the Indian subcontinent, there are so many forms and variations of it, it really depends on who you ask and who you're buying from. If you're making it at home, I would definitely recommend that you have some turmeric in there just for that classically yellow color. And by the way, if you haven't seen our turmeric episode, what are you waiting for? I would also recommend that you get yourself some fenugreek if you haven't, because fenugreek smells and tastes almost exactly like what I imagined the platonic ideal of curry to be. It's quite amazing, but we'll save that for another show. I also think that you absolutely need ginger and cumin and coriander and garlic and probably some cinnamon and other warm spices in there too. Honestly, the more the better, but um, you know, adjust your own taste. For my mix today, I'm gonna go in with some cinnamon, allspice, green cardamom, black cardamom, cloves, ginger powder, star anise ground freshly if you can, nutmeg, turmeric, cumin, coriander, fenugreek, fennel, black pepper, cayenne. Depending on your spice tolerance, feel free to hike up or down your cayenne pepper intake. Sweet paprika, ground oregano, a pinch of bay leaves if you'd like, some kosher salt, and garlic and onion powder. As always, spices will taste more fragrant, nuttier, a lot more intense and nuanced if you buy them whole, toast them on the stove, let it cool, and grind it up yourself. And if you do buy them pre-ground already, I highly recommend that you throw them into a tiny little pot and throw them over light, low heat, and just give them a toss until they're toasted about one minute in. You wanna make sure that you're constantly stirring, flipping, whatever, to make sure nothing is burning. You just wanna hit those oily fragrance notes. For our potato curry, the first thing I'm gonna do is melt some butter and we're gonna fry off some curry leaves. The curry leaves will give your curry an even more fragrant flavor. Once our curry leaves are fried to crispiness, we're gonna fish them out and into the butter, we're gonna go in with one medium red onion chopped, six cloves of garlic, some ginger minced, along with our curry powder, a little more ground cardamom, as well as some kosher salt. And we're gonna stir that for about a minute or two until the spices smell really good and fragrant. To add a layer of umami, we're gonna go in with some tomato paste. We're gonna let that caramelize a little bit. And then we're gonna go in with the rest of my evaporated milk because that thing's gonna go bad if I don't use it soon. <laughs> and then we'll go in with some chicken broth or water. If you like it a little bit spicier, obviously go in with your chilies of choice. Give it a nice good mix, let that come up to a simmer, and then we're gonna go in with our peeled and cubed potatoes. Also remember that if you're dealing with older potatoes, if you see any green, peel it away. That is toxic. Clamp a lid on it or not, whatever you want. Just stir it occasionally to make sure nothing's burning, to make sure all the potatoes are getting immersed in there and getting nice and tender and creamy. And you know we can't have curry without rice, so while the curry's going, we're gonna set a pot of rice to boil. This rice is gonna be cardamom rice. I'm just gonna take about a cup of rice, rinse it until the water's mostly clear, set it on the heat in a small pot with just enough water to cover about half an inch over that rice level, and then I'm gonna throw in a teaspoon of ground cardamom. And then towards the last five minutes of the cooking, we're gonna go in with some peas, just so that they retain that vibrantly green color. Oh yeah, spicy, fragrant, crunchy from the fried leaves, tender, creamy potatoes, the rice, distinct grains, lightly floral, but you can't really put your finger on it. Now, I was thinking that because we have that bread coming down the pipeline, we should probably make some jam for it. 
And in particular, I think orange marmalade would go fantastically with the citrusy, minty notes of cardamom. If you've never made jam at home before, fear not. It is basically fruit, water, sugar, heat, time. When it comes to making orange marmalade though, we have to be careful of the pith. We want the zest because that's where all the fragrance and the flavor is, but the pith, the white part, that's bitter. So if you're using a big orange like this, I recommend that you go ahead and zest it, save the zest, we'll sliver it into thin little strips, and then we're going to trim away that white pithy part that is going to be so bitter that it's going to kind of cloud your marmalade. If you like that bitter sweetness, keep it in, but for me, I just like it citrusy sweet. Alternatively, you can also go ahead and use thin skinned citrus fruits like tangerines, clementines, mandarins. You can go ahead and keep the pith in here because they're so skinny, they won't really affect the flavor that much. I'm also going to go ahead and add in the zest and the juice of one lemon. This is going to perk up our jam flavors. While you're prepping your fruit, go ahead and save the seeds. We're going to wrap those in a cheesecloth or a coffee filter if you don't have cheesecloth like me. And we're going to smash our cardamom pods alongside those seeds, wrap them up, and throw them into our pot. The seeds contain pectin, which will help your jam thicken naturally. Bring your jam up to a gradual simmer and just let it cook about 20 to 30 minutes until that gel texture pops up. When you're making jams and jellies, your temperature should reach around 220 to 225 degrees Fahrenheit. You can also do the plate test where you put a plate in the freezer and then once you think your jam is ready, pull the plate out of the freezer, smear a little bit of jam on there and see if it sets immediately. Your objective when it comes to making jam is basically canning the fruit. In the early minutes of making jam, you really don't want to stir it too much. The only time you do want to stir it is towards the end to make sure nothing is burning on the bottom of the pot. The more viciously it bubbles, the more you have to keep an eye on it. More bubbles means it's getting closer and closer. When it comes to making jam, the biggest mistake is probably overcooking it. By the time it looks glazy and jammy while it's still hot, once it cools, it's gonna harden into a rock candy. So unless you're going for orange flavored Jolly Ranchers, just be patient and keep an eye on it. As soon as the bubbles clear a little bit and that syrupy jamminess starts to look even thicker and even glassier, get ready. Get ready and pull out that plate and give it a test. I think we're good to go. You know you're getting close when you see lots of little glossy bubbles on top of your pot. Even if it still looks really liquidy, don't worry, it will set up. Right now, this mixture is super hot. Once you turn off the heat, let it cool down a little bit so that you can kind of squeeze out that packet of cardamom and seeds. Then go ahead and pull out your sterilized jars. Now, even if you're not canning, you have to use clean jars. Otherwise, your jam will get really icky and bacterially. Nobody wants bacterially jam. My favorite way to sterilize jars, plop them into a pot of boiling water and just let it boil for a few minutes. Fish it out with some tongs safely. Be careful, that water is extremely hot. Please do not burn yourself. After the fourth or fifth turn on your bread dough, it should start to look really shiny, really nice and taut, holding surface tension across that top of the loaf as you shape it. And that's when you know it's ready for buttering your loaf pan and shaping. I'm gonna use a nine by five loaf pan, just butter it generously so that the bread can slide out once it's baked. And then we're gonna take our dough and we're just gonna lift and shape it a couple more times to make sure it's as compact and tight as possible. We're gonna lift it into the loaf pan and let it settle, give it a little jiggle so that it sets into the corners. And then I like to brush the top of the loaf with a little bit more melted butter. And then at this point, you can put on more sunflower seeds if you'd like. We're gonna let it proof until it doubles or just rises about an inch above that lip of the pan. Once we're about 20 minutes from baking, I like to set a pan of water on the bottom shelf of my oven so that we create a steam environment. I like to blast the oven up to 450 degrees during the preheat stage so that when we put the bread in, we can immediately drop that temperature to 425 and let it bake for about 15 minutes or so. Obviously keep an eye on it. Every oven works a little bit differently. Every pan cooks a little bit differently. So your variations might mean 375 for the last 15 minutes your last 15 minutes might be 10 minutes just use your eyeballs and your nose to gauge the doneness the tops should be a dark golden brown 
seeds should be toasted, and that loaf should sound set. I find that the best way to test bread doneness is with an instant read thermometer. Stick it in, it should read from 195 to 210 degrees, right around that boiling point for water. Let your bread baby cool off and then knock it gently out of the loaf pan, slice it up, butter it, jam it, eat it. You know what they say, more butter, more better. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. I'm not sure what could be better than fresh baked bread with fresh made jam and butter. Probably nothing. Cheers. Wow. Wow. The nuttiness of the sunflower seeds mixing in with that fresh mintiness of the cardamom and the seeds, Ethan, you were right. They pop. The crusty crust of the bread contrasted with that moist, buttered, jammy interior. Am I a mess? Mm-hmm. I don't care. <laughs> Rustic and hearty, sweet and fruity, the gumminess of the orange rinds, the texture is fantastic all the way through each bite. The bitterness that usually comes with the orange peel is really tamed by that almost medicinal freshness of cardamom and it just works. And since we're gonna have a hot oven going, we should make some Pfeffenusse. Pfeffenusse are a small cookie originating from Germany and they mean pepper nuts. Now, they don't really have any nuts in them, but we're going to put some almond flour in them because I find that almond flour just makes it very tender, very delicious and moist. Pfeffenusse is kind of a perfect vehicle for cardamom because it's got lots of spices in it. And yes, we will be hitting it with a lot of spices today. I'm going to take some softened butter, cream it with some sugar. If you've never creamed butter and sugar together by hand, it's a good workout. Stream in some molasses, and to that we're gonna add some freshly grated ginger along with the zest of an orange, one tablespoon rum for flavoring. We're gonna drop in an egg, make sure that's whisked all the way through until it's smooth. And then we're gonna make our dry mixture, which is going to have almond flour, all-purpose flour, baking soda, kosher salt, along with a blend of nine spices, including cardamom, cinnamon, ginger, anise seed, nutmeg, allspice, cloves, black pepper, and white pepper. Because it is, after all, a pepper nut. We're going to fold our dry mixture into our butter mixture until everything's combined, and then we'll let it chill for a little bit while we preheat the oven to the proper temperature. Once the dough has hydrated, it's gonna be a little bit easier to work with. Once it's chilled, you can scoop it and portion it into balls, set it about an inch to two inches apart on baking sheets with parchment papers, and then we're gonna bake it until they're nice and puffy and set. Fefanusa often has a icing or a sugar coating, so we're gonna make a little glaze for it as well. I'm gonna take some powdered sugar. I'm gonna put some of this coquito that a friend made for me in there along with a pinch of cardamom, and we're going to whisk it until it's nice and smooth and drizzleable. Do you want some cardamom icing? Once your cookies emerge out of the oven, let them cool off a little bit and then take them off the parchment and dip them into that icing glaze. Should be really thick. And if you like it, sprinkle on a little more cardamom on top for a garnish. There's really nothing more to say other than massively delicious. I think your holiday cookies just got a touch better. That's not to say that you have to wait for the holidays for these cookies. You can have them all year round. Okie doke then. Are we ready for dinner? I feel like thus far we have been neglecting the black cardamom a little bit. So I'm thinking we should put it into some sticky rice along with Chinese sausage, mushrooms, and what have you from my fridge. Maybe we'll go ahead and chop up a little bit onion, garlic, ginger, you know, the holy trinity. We'll throw in some scallions. We'll use up some bok choy for vegetables, you know, cause we sure have eaten a lot of sugar today. I'm gonna turn my Instant Pot on to saute. I'm gonna drop in some oil, wait for that to heat, and then I'm gonna go in with everything. So all the chopped veggies, mushrooms, sausage. We'll season it with a little bit of salt, soy sauce, oyster sauce, whatever you want. 
white pepper, and obviously black cardamom. We're gonna stir that around until everything is nice and golden and you can smell all the spices and the soy sauces coming off of that pot. And then we're gonna go in with our rice. Now, a word about cooking with glutinous or sticky rice, it is way better for you to soak it beforehand. So this morning, I rinsed it a couple of times and then I left it in some water. I think we're good to go. As to how much water to put into your rice, I don't know. I'm gonna go for about a one to one ratio. Just guessing. I'm gonna go in with a little bit of sesame oil and then I'm gonna lay my bok choy on top. We're going to salt it a little bit. We're gonna clamp it. We're gonna set it and we're gonna forget it until it beeps at us. I think I for sure miscalculated the water because it does seem a little bit gooey, but it smells good. What I'm finding is that cardamom is really good at pulling disparate spices and flavors together. Like, I can't really taste the cardamom in here, but the spiciness and the savoriness of all of our other condiments melds perfectly into one bite magic of cardamom. It's also lending a spotlight towards the sweeter components like the glutinous rice and the sugar in the sausages. And I don't know, as soggy as it is, this is a pretty satisfying dinner. It's almost creamy the way that macaroni and cheese is. I guess that's a good thing. Well, y'all, today we have done it all. From breakfast to beverages, to dessert, to lunch, to dinner, ah, <sighs> cardamom. Make it the new cinnamon. Heck, make it the new black pepper. I think we've seen that it can both do sweet and savory equally well. If you have a cardamom recipe that I didn't get to today that you love, you know what to do. Drop us a comment down below along with whatever other spices you wanna see featured next. Until I see you next time, stay flavorful.